We have some representatives from Physio here, so maybe uh, I'll let you take it away. Hello, hello everyone. If I could get your attention really quickly. So hello, I am Kat Benavides. I'm the president of the Physics Student Union and I have some lovely executives with me here. Um, a couple of fun things that I like to do. I'm a student pilot and um, I'm the soprano or a soprano for the Hearth House Opera. So they'll introduce themselves now. Hey everyone, I'm Addy. I'm Physio's uh, Vice President of Social Events. I'm a third year doing an astrophysics and uh, astrophysics specialist and a chem minor. And I am on one of the university's Dragon Boat teams. Hello, I'm Justin. I'm the asset manager for Physio. Uh, I teach Taekwondo for the UFT Taekwondo organization uh, today and tomorrow actually. And uh, yeah, that's it. I totally forgot to tell you what programs I'm in. So I'm doing a specialist in astrophysics. I'm majoring in archeology span and I'm minoring in math. So very quickly, I didn't want to take up too much time um, in terms of your class today, but we are holding first year representative elections soon. So we do have a form that we will be sending out through email, through Discord, and um, you'll find it somehow you can also see us at McLennan, room 217. If you have any questions, one of us will definitely be there. So we will be sending out the form tonight and um, applications will be open for two weeks, followed by one week of campaigning. And then there will be a speech, uh, well, you will be doing a speech um, pertaining to why you think you should be first year representative. So this is a really fun role. So. You get to work with really amazing people. And um, so FISU does stand for equity, diversity, and inclusivity. And we want to extend that towards the first years as well. Um, so the first year role is, um, it's not too jarring. It's just a matter of getting involved in your physics community, talking to your other first year peers, and um, basically just spreading the word about social events to your friends. And yeah, it's, it's nothing too jarring again. And we would really like to see as many of you uh, nominate yourselves as possible. So in terms of what you need to apply, um, obviously we want your UTOR ID. So that's not the number, that is the, um, it's like your, it's a version of your name with maybe a number at the end. So we want that. Um, we want what physics class you're in. So just say you're in PHY 131 or 151 or whatever it is. And um, as well as two of your friends to, um, to kind of boost that. So we want their emails, the fact that they are also in a physics class. So we want their um, course code as well. And that's pretty much it. So thank you for uh, your time and enjoy Professor Harlow's lectures. He's a fantastic <laughs> professor. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, also, we're gonna be having a Halloween event on October 28th, which is a Friday. Uh, and it's going to be in collaboration with the Astronomy Union. Mm -hmm. We had one last year, and it was a massive success and loads of fun. So make sure to turn up. Thank you very much. All of these student unions get supported. And I remember when um, astronomy and physics had the same student union. And then they split. And I thought this was terrible. But in ter actually, in fact, they still do things together, and they get twice as much support because <laughs> there's no, there's, there's two. But um, I, I told you guys that I would uh, load your wave video into the tracker software, so I did that, and it was so the what was most difficult for me was um, uh, modeling the wave as a point particle. So I had to click on what I thought was the center of the wave. Some people stood up. I was like, oh wait. I was kind of going like towards the back there. I don't know. It's, it is hard to model a wave as a point particle. Anyway, you can sort of see. And I, I also dropped 18 meters as, as was what uh, we measured that day from here to here. But that was along the carpet and it's much farther back there. Anyway, I don't know. I got, I think when we did it in class, I estimated three. This looks more like about five meters per second like plus or minus three or something like that. So, so it's, it's a bit hard to measure, but it's a nice straight line you can see. And there, the acceleration is zero plus or minus maybe 0.5 meters per second squared. So, so I think maybe it doesn't accelerate, but it's, it's a little hard to, to tell there. So 
thanks for participating in that. That's kind of fun. Um, kinematics of Khan Hall. Uh, so tonight, so this afternoon, actually at two o'clock, there's this um, uh, global climate strike over at Queens Park. You may want to check that out. It'll be a lot of people there, I guess. But um, I have to teach at that time. But so, so I'll just tell you a little story, not related to this. But um, it's about cycling. You know, I cycle, and um, my wife also cycles. And sometimes she rides around in, in High Park. And she's not one of these Lycra people with a racing bike or something. She's a 48-year-old woman with a basket and a bell and stuff like that. So I was surprised one morning last summer when I got a text from her saying I got a speeding ticket. And I said, I thought to myself, that's kind of weird. I didn't know she was driving anywhere today. I, but I knew she was going to be biking. So I sort of jokingly texted back to her. I said, you mean on your bike? And she responded, yes. And so... <laughs> I was like, what? And it turns out that in High Park, uh, there's a road that she rides on, and it's posted 20 kilometers per hour as the speed limit. And so what the cops did is they went down to the bottom of a very steep hill and with their guns, and they were um, giving, it, her ticket was for $125. They were giving tickets. They gave like, I don't know, hundreds, dozens of tickets that day. And they, they went out a few times handing speeding tickets to the bicycles, as of course the cars flew by going even faster than them. So, so rather than pay the, the 125, she's, <laughs> she's taken this to divisional court. This is part, part of her uh, affidavit, so I'll just show you a couple clips from it because it's, it it's kind of funny, but it's, well, I don't know if it's funny, charter challenge. This is a photograph of where she got ticketed. And in fact, you can even see the cops down at the bottom here with their, their guns aimed up. And there's a car going by. But this is the bike lane that she was on. This is where the pedestrians go on a great big wide sidewalk. And there's, you know, it's High Park. It's a very nice park if you haven't been there. It's the biggest park in Toronto. It's sort of about six subway stations west of here. Um, and, of course, and then we also bought a little uh, uh, speed gun. And this is my daughter, Zainab, coming down. Uh, she's 10 years old. And she's getting clocked at three, 33 kilometers per hour. So she would get a speeding ticket for 125. So I guess her argument, she has sort of two arguments. One is that she has no speedometer on her bike. So how could she possibly know that she was speeding? And her other argument is, is that she actually thinks that the speed limit should be higher for bikes than for cars in the park. And here's part of the reasoning. Um, so it has to do with the mass. So the mass of uh, a car is much, much higher than the mass of a bike. So if you get hit by a car, it's likely to do much more damage to you uh, than uh, if, it was, if it was a bike, sort of proportionally. And of course, there's other issues as well, such as uh, a bike can stop much more quickly than a car, and a bike has you know, much more um, fewer, I guess, blind spots and, and better visibility and awareness of their surroundings than a, than a car. So <laughs> I have no idea if this is going to work, but there's Newton's third law. <laughs> there's an equal and opposite force in the pedestrian being struck, yielding an acceleration of 180 Gs, which is enough to kill you if you get hit by a car. And of course, we made some assumptions of 30 kilometers an hour. Whereas if a bicycle was doing that, it would yield maybe 11.5 G, which is uncomfortable, but not deadly. It's not fun to get hit by a bike, obviously, but um, it's not going to cause a fatality. So, OK. So we're getting into Newton's laws here, and I thought this was sort of topical. I think I want to do a demo. We're about ready for this video here. Um, so I think what we'll do, maybe what we'll do first is the, I'll deliver the first question. Deliver. Two carts are at rest. One has a lot of mass on it. An e uh, equal positive force, maybe from a fan or something, is applied to both over the same amount of time which travels further. So there's Newton's second law. We're sort of reviewing it. We did go over it last time. Acceleration is force divided by mass. Maybe we'll do these two questions as learning catalytics, and then uh, I will try to do a demonstration where we'll actually test this and see, see which works. And then we can actually work it out and solve for what, what, the, uh, what the distance traveled looks like. So we'll do your prediction, then demo, and then the math. 
So let me give you a minute to work on that. It's so quiet in here. D equals half AT squared or something like that, maybe. Give you another 15 seconds to click in and then I've got a more difficult question and then we'll do the demos. Yep. Just to, I'll just put them on there. Sounds good. All right, so that's that one. Um, we can look at that top two. Uh, so 92% of you say that the less massive cart, so I think this is right, it'll have a higher acceleration because the denominator has mass, same force on both the carts, the same fan maybe, so the fan is pr producing some constant force. Um, and and so if distance, if they're released from rest, then the distance that travels is gonna be zero plus one half AT squared. So, so higher acceleration, it goes farther. Okay, so go back to this one. Next question is a bit different. I'll deliver it here. Deliver, okay. This one says two carts are moving at the same positive velocity to the right. Um, one has a lot of mass on it, and an equal negative force to the left is applied to both. I guess slowing them down. So, they start with the same velocity, they've got the same force slowing them down um, over the same amount of time, which travels farther. I'll give you a minute to just think about that. Think, pair, share. You know, compare your answer with your neighbor. Huh? Yeah, that was your minute. Want to see uh, what people are answering? Oh, you guys. Going once, going twice. I, I thought this one was kind of hard, but uh, it's the opposite. Somehow the more massive one goes farther. So let's actually try to do it. Um, what do I do if I have ox plate? There we go. So the first question was, and what we're gonna have to do, I don't have two carts, I just have one, but what I wanna do is turn on the fan. Whoop. Oh. Let's do the first one Whoop. like this. So if you start it from rest, turn on the fan and release it. One, 1,000, two, 1,000, So if they're two seconds, it's pretty much cleared the whole track. But if I load it up with a bunch of mass, and turn on the same force, 
1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000. It's speeding up, but it's speeding up a lot slower. So the less massive cart goes a lot farther. But now, <laughs> this one's a lot harder to actually show. I want to start it with some initial velocity, maybe like walking speed or something. This is hard to do. I'm going to go give it a, and release it. And then I'm going to try to release it with the same initial speed, but with a bunch of mass on it. We'll see which goes farther. So let's turn it on. <laughs> Whoa, it stops right away. Not very massive. It doesn't have very much inertia. So now let's load it up with a bunch of mass. About two kilograms. <laughs> I didn't think. Thank you. Maybe not that much mass. <laughs> and again, start it going. And it goes farther. Okay, does that sort of make sense? It's got more, whoops, more inertia. So that extra mass carries it along farther than if it had no mass and it stops very quickly. So it's, 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 it's acceleration in the opposite direction of the velocity. If it's more, it doesn't go as far. So we can do it actually as a problem. Um, it says, a cart of mass m is at rest. A constant force f in the plus x direction is applied to it. Thank you. <laughs> what else I got? Here's mass. I'm going to define plus x is to the right. And there's a force here applied to the right. Find how far does it travel in time t? So find delta x in time t. So the, the force diagram, you can write the normal force, I guess, the surface on the cart, and then the gravity force, earth on the cart. Those cancel out. And then what's important here is the force of the fan on the cart. This is the fan force, maybe the air or something. I'm going to neglect friction. Just pretend that it's a frictionless surface or assume no friction. Uh, this is like F surface on cart and F earth on cart cancel. That's supposed to be E on C. Um, and then so the, the sum of forces is equal to F force on cart. Um, equals F to the right. Some number which I'll call F. So Newton's second law is simply that acceleration, whoop, acceleration is equal to the sum of forces divided by the mass equals F over M. I'm going to use uh, Delta X is equal to V zero T plus one half A T squared. And V zero equals zero. So I got Delta X is equal to one half uh, F over M times T squared. So lower M higher Delta X. The less massive cart travels further. And then we can do the same exact reasoning, but this time with an initial velocity that's non-zero and a negative acceleration. Sorry, an initial, positive, initial velocity that's positive and a negative acceleration, so slow down. And doing great for time. Cart of mass m is moving initially in the positive v direction. So I can put that on here but I've flipped around the fan so it's pointed backwards. There's your F. And here's your little wheels. And again, define, it's good to put your plus X axis. 
the right. The question is, how far? Um, uh, in time, t does it go? I guess, assuming that it goes to the right, you can draw again, same free body diagram, Earth surface on the cart, force of the earth on the cart, and the force of the fan on the cart. Um, and the forces in the f direction are going to be just negative f. This one equals f. So acceleration in the x direction is the sum of the forces in the x direction divided by the mass. Again, negative f over m. And again, we'll use delta x is equal to v0 t plus 1 half a sub x t squared. So I'm being a little more careful now with my subscripts. Maybe this should say v0x. These come up a lot when we get into two-dimensional motion. Uh, in the future chapters, you might have y instead of x. OK, so, and I don't really know how to simplify it much more than that. It's equal to v0t minus ft squared over 2m. So basically, what I'm saying here is that the more massive cart has uh, a smaller ft squared over 2m value. So I would say that negative ft squared over 2m is uh, less negative. So it goes farther, probably. That's why delta x is higher, at least initially. Make sense? And you can kind of think of it as the inertia is what's carrying it along, and all that mass on it. As long as you neglect friction, <laughs> then more mass with the equal force is going to cause something to slow down less. Okay. So that's Sarah Newton's second law kind of review. I wanted to talk about Newton's third law, which is the equal and opposite forces rule. This one seems sort of straightforward, but it's, it's, it's a little tricky conceptually, and this is a foundational concept, so I do want you to kind of get it, think about it. When two objects interact, uh, object one exerts a force on object two, then object two exerts an equal magnitude oppositely directed force on object one. So if you're using that subscript notation, which we really like to use in the textbook, uh, it's F one on two equals negative F two on one. Same magnitude, but opposite directions. And these form what I'm gonna call, uh, this is an uh, interaction pair. So what I'm going to argue to you is that every single force in the world is always one half of an interaction pair. If I press on, a, on this table, the table presses backwards on me. Okay. And there is no force that you can think of that isn't part of an interaction pair in which there's Newton's third law applies. And I can give you some examples. So what I'm doing next. So forces always come in pairs. Every force interaction involves two objects and two forces. In fact, it's really momentum that's being transferred between these two things. So these forces are always equal in strength, opposite in direction, are always the same kind of force. So if I'm pushing on the table with a normal force, the table pushes back on me with a normal force. They're always the same. Or in the case, I guess it's also a normal force in the case of the, the diver or something, but um, even gravity, there's gonna be pairs, uh, tension. If you pull on a rope, there's gonna be an uh, opposite pull on the other side. And the forces always act on different objects. <laughs> this 
is my question. Do you really believe this? A truck is pushing a car up an incline with a constant forward acceleration. It's pushing it up and they're, they're accelerating. The incline has an angle theta. The car and the truck remain in contact during the acceleration. Is it true that the force of the truck on the car is equal and opposite to the force of the car on the truck? Well, yes, that's Newton's third law. So I'm telling you it's true. But very few people really believe me when I t say this. So I don't know. It's, uh, it takes some, some thinking. Um, but one way that I think of it is that there's always an interaction. So if I think of this spring and I compress it, the spring is sort of symmetric. It doesn't know which end is which. So if I press, <laughs> you know, in with my right hand and compress it, I feel this push on both hands. It's the same. If I push in with my left hand, it doesn't matter what's going on with the spring, it's going to push both hands equally. And I, I try to imagine that's between the truck and the car. The spring doesn't know that one is a truck thing and one is a car thing. It just pushes. It just creates this pushing force. It prevents the truck and car from swooshing into each other. It's a repulsive force, but it doesn't take sides and choose the lighter one or something, or choose the one that the, the acceleration direction or something like that. And it's not responsible for accelerating anything. It's responsible for keeping the, the car and the truck from, from kind of melding into each other, right? It pushes with an equal force on the truck and the car. That's what I'm trying to tell you. So just to continue along with absurd things, I'm going to do a battle, which is Mack truck versus mosquito. And you're going to vote for the winner here versus. So what you have to imagine is that going you know, north on a highway is a Mack truck. And then going south on the same highway is a mosquito going. And they're going to collide, OK? So you have to like imagine the buildup. What will happen? Oh, no. And so my question is, will A, the magnitude of the force of the Mack truck and the mosquito be bigger, largest? Or will the magnitude of the force of the mosquito on the Mack truck be larger? Or are they both equal? my guns there. <laughs> okay. Let's do another question. 
First, let's see what the answer is to this one. Uh, sent all. Yeah, that's Newton's third law. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know. So um, I don't know if anybody believes me here. I'm going to stop the delivery of that and give you another question, which is slightly different, which is uh, comparing not the force, but the damage done on the two members of this collision. Does a, does a truck do more damage to the mosquito, or does the mosquito do more damage to the truck? I'll give you one minute to think about that. This is a little bit like my wife's affidavit. <laughs> something to do with the accelerations involved. <laughs> yeah, Morgan. Maybe later. <laughs> okay. Going once. Going twice. Let's see what people are saying here. Oh, here we go. I like it. Stop. I was hoping that this would be okay. Clearly, if they're going to court or something and suing for damages, you know, the, the Mack truck driver didn't even see his coffee jiggle. <laughs> and yet... The mosquito is completely wiped out from existence, and so there's future earnings and all kinds of, like, you know, the wife of the mosquito is going to really sue for all kinds of damage that got happened to the mosquito. So, okay, so what's going on there? And this is related, again, back to Newton's second law, which states that if the force is equal on the truck and on the mosquito, is the acceleration equal? Well, acceleration is higher uh, if... Uh, the mass is lower. So the Mosquito accelerates more than the Mack truck um, by the same ratio of, as, of their masses. And, and it's the acceleration is what actually kills you here and, and scrambles your, your molecules or something. It's those Gs. Okay, and so and we, we're having this discussion about that, the truck and the car and the hill. And this kind of relates to this one. Again, there's a, there's a donkey who has learned, if I pull forward on the wagon, the wagon will pull backwards on me with an equal and opposite force, then I'm never going to get anywhere. I'm never going to be able to pull this wagon. So there is a flaw in this reasoning. And it has to do with a couple of things. So, so first of all, I would say, wait, I can never accelerate the wagon. You're saying here that forces cancel, right? But remember, Newton's third law, these uh, interaction pairs always act on different objects. So one of the forces in this interaction pair is acting on the donkey, and one is acting on the wagon. So if you're going to draw a force diagram, you always choose an object, right? So which are you going to choose? It, they're never going to show up in the same force diagram, so they're never going to cancel. Does that make sense? Interaction pairs are on different objects, so they usually don't cancel each other out unless you're taking the whole system or something. So another way of looking at it is it, it is the first sentence of the donkey's reasoning, reasoning is correct. The wagon really does pull back on the donkey with an equal and opposite force if the donkey pulls forward on the wagon. Those don't cancel because they're on different objects. Um, what's important here is that there's a third object involved, which is the ground. The forward static friction on the donkey's feet from the ground is larger than the backward rolling friction of the, uh, on the wheels of the wagon. So this overall system of donkey connected to wagon 
has a net forward force on it provided by the earth, like the ground, I guess. And that is why they both can accelerate together. And it's going to be the exact same situation of the, the truck pushing the car up the hill. Yeah, they're pushing on each other with equal and opposite forces. But if you think of them as a system, there's a static friction force which is pushing them both, accelerating them both up the hill. So we're going to talk a little bit about friction next, because this is a little weird. <laughs> Doesn't friction slow things down? I'm saying here the friction speeds things up. So, so uh, what happens when you step on the gas on your, in your car? OK. You go, right? <laughs> it's the go pedal. I go. But let's break it down. What really happens here? And I, I tend to think of it as, what if there were no friction? Well, if there's no friction, you've sort of seen this in the winter sometimes. Someone steps on the gas in their car. If they're on a very icy surface, then their wheel just spins around. And it doesn't go, OK? So what's really happening here is that you are rotating, it creates a torque which rotates the, the wheels. If it's rear-wheel drive, it rotates them counterclockwise. And what that does is it pushes backward on the ground because of friction. You've got the bottom surface of, the, of your tire wants to push backwards on the ground. So by Newton's third law, uh, there's an equal and opposite force of the, the ground on the bottom of the wheel, which pushes forward on the wheel. And that is the force which accelerates your car. If you are on a slippery surface, friction goes away and you cannot go. So if I'm going to walk to the right, what I do is I use my feet, I push backwards on the, on the carpet, and then the carpet pushes forwards on me and I accelerate towards the right. <laughs> this poor camera guy <laughs> is trying to, trying to follow me. He's I'll get away from you. <laughs> okay, oh, stop. So again, I'm putting the static friction on my feet is allowing me to dodge the cameraman back and forth. All right. Okay, so here's another interaction pair, rocket gas pressure interaction. This even works in space, luckily, which is that you have a rocket. Uh, it sends out exhaust. It accelerates the exhaust in one direction. And so by Newton's third law, that exhaust gas pushes forward on the rocket. So you don't even actually need the Earth um, to accelerate yourself. If you're out in space and there's no Earth handy, you can just shoot a lot of very fast gases that way, and you will go that way. And that is how you accelerate uh, rockets in space. All right, you want to try to identify an interaction here? This is a weird one. I don't think you guys are going to like this one, but we'll see. So again, this is uh, identifying uh, a, a force, the other half of a force interaction pair in which Newton's third law applies. So the, one of them is gravity pulls the basketball down. So what's the other force in, the, in that Newton's third law interaction pair. Think about that. Pick one. I think it's one, only one on this list really is the, the correct answer. And uh, check with your friend if you, have some, if, you're, if you have a neighbor.
How's it going out there? This might, people are laughing about the answer to this one, but because it is a little bit abstract, let's say. There's the sun. Okay. Let's see what the vote is looking like, um, and then I'll discuss. So we might as well, not too much left. A lot of people are voting for D, 56%, and then 38% uh, are voting for E. I have colored in D as the green one, so you know that I, when I do that, means that I have an opinion. Uh, so if I was to weigh on the, in on this, I would say, look, it's an interaction pair. This is Newton's third law. Um, they have to be equal and opposite, and they have to be the same kind of force. So if there's gravity pulling this basketball down, then there must be a pair in which <laughs> there's gravity of the basketball pulling the earth up. So it, it's sort of silly. Um, not silly, but it's, it's definitely pretty abstract, right? Like what, you know, why, what's going on there? So what I would say, if you want to use fonts to kind of indicate things, you've got acceleration of the ball is equal to, maybe it's 4.9 newtons is the force, divided by the mass of the ball, which is 0.5 kilograms. And you get uh, 4.9 divided by 0.5 equals 9.8 meters per second squared. That's the acceleration of the ball. And then what you do is the acceleration of the Earth is equal to the same, so it's, it's 4.9, Newtons, that is the same as this one by Newton's third law. So when you are applying Newton's third law, you write down uh, the Newton's second law for two different objects, and then you can connect them. Do, 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 but these are the same. And I'll say my same by Newton's third law. They actually show up in different force diagrams, but because they're different objects, and don't forget to divide by the mass. Divided by the mass of the Earth, which was, I got 6 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. I looked that up online. So the answer for the acceleration is 8 times 10 to the minus 25 meters per second squared is the acceleration of the Earth. Because it has more mass than the basketball. They pull in each other with equal forces, but their accelerations are quite different. And, you know, 10 to the minus 25 meters per second squared is effectively zero. You don't feel it. Okay. So that was that one. Thank you for your, and so let's go back, since, since you mentioned this, let's, let's go back to this. Draw force diagrams for the truck and the car. Identify the interaction pair that links these two objects. So what I'm gonna do, let's do two diagrams here. I'm gonna, on this side, let's draw the truck which I'm gonna call T, and on this side, let's draw the car, which I'm gonna call C. So in both cases, let's draw a dot, and we'll draw uh, the force diagrams. And why don't we do them, the forces that we can think about, we'll draw them in red here. So, um, well, they're both on this slope, right? So you might as well put uh, the force, um, let's call it normal or something like that, of the surface on the truck, Let's call this the surface, S equals surface. <laughs> S is the surface. So the surface has a normal force and it also has a friction force. So F normal of the surface on the truck. We've also got the same sort of thing going on here, it's maybe less, I'm not drawing these to scale. F normal of the uh, surface on the car. They're also being pulled down towards the center of the Earth by gravity, F gravity, I guess, of the Earth on the truck, and F gravity, F sub G, I guess, of the Earth on the car. And then um, the truck, well, the truck is pushing on the car, so I can draw this the F of the truck on the car, that's like a pushing force or something. And then, 
So let's draw little vectors on all these forces because they're all vectors. The, the car must push backwards on the truck. F car on truck. And we can right now go to our green pen or something and say, dee, 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 dee. this one and this one are the equal in magnitude. These are the interaction pair. Interaction pair. I don't know if you have different colored pens, but so these uh, equal magnitudes. So this gives you an equation. If you're going to solve something, um, these have equal magnitudes. But we're not done with the forces going up and down the hill. There's also this friction force of the surface on, on these two objects. So, and what I'm going to say here is that there's a, there's a really big force of friction of the surface on the truck. And there might be some friction on the car, but it's, it's very small. This is like the force friction oops, of the surface on the car. The car is dead, meaning that it, it's getting pushed up the hill. Maybe it's car, it's a uh, engine is dead or something like that. So there might be some backwards friction slowing down the car, but it's very small compared to the forward, that accelerating friction, static friction on the wheels of the truck. And that's what's keeping this whole system going up the hill. The key force here, which is, is really important, is this one. I'm going to call it, I'm going to go to black here. This is um, the force that accelerates the system. And it's not equal and opposite to anything. Well, what is it equal? It's equal and opposite to the force of the truck on the surface of the road backwards or something. But that's what gets these guys going. Okay. All right. I think I am pretty, let's, let's do one more uh, quick thing to think about um, over the weekend, which is uh, tennis ball. After, um, after having been thrown upward, this tennis ball, falls back in your hand and you catch it. While you're catching it, is the force that they, you exert in the tennis ball more than, less than, or equal, or the same as the force that you exert in the tennis ball when you're holding it at rest? So if I hold it like this, or when I'm catching it, whoop, and slowing it down. And I've lost my ball there. <laughs> Have a great weekend, and I'll see you guys on Monday. Thank you. Cheers.